So there are a lot of ways to classify wind turbines, but perhaps the two most popular are what we call the horizontal axis wind turbine and the vertical axis wind turbine. Now, I'm a huge fan of vertical axis wind turbines, or VAWTs, and of those, there are two really popular types, and that's the Dureus type and the Savonius type. Now, Dureus types, well, there's only three of them, and for the Savonius types, there's essentially now what you normally see, of course, is a wind turbine in that direction when it's a vertical axis. So this is a Savonius type, which is just two scoops and works by differential drag. So the wind blows in here, turns it, and there's less drag on this surface, so it always turns in that direction. And you quite often see them in that orientation, because there's nothing to change if you put it in that orientation and there's lots of suggestions to put this kind of wind turbine along things like motorways to pick up the air from the traffic or the, the moving air from the traffic, make it rotate and use that as part of the smart motorway program. Because that orientation does differ and when it's in that orientation it's more commonly known as a cross-flow wind turbine. Cross-flow wind turbines, you might recognise them more, actually, from something this, like this, which is a squirrel cage rotor. This you'll find in things like air conditioning fans, blower units, that sort of stuff. It was actually invented in 1891 by Paul Motier with the French patent number 215662 and registered in the United States. The main purpose was to utilise it for mine ventilation, but it was overlooked. However, there was a re-emergence of interest in the late 1920s and early 1930s with a variety of industrial inventions and different applications such as drying grain, air conditioning which came in round about there and the injection of pulverised fuel into furnaces. It was also used by Anthony Mitchell who designed the cross-flow hydro turbine in 1903 and Donat Bankey who founded this theoretical approach in 1922 and that made it known as the Bankey Mitchell turbine. At the same time Fritz Osberger developed Mitchell's design and painted it and therefore that kind of turbine is mostly known as a Bankey Mitchell turbine and an Osberger turbine and it's one of the main varieties of cross-flow used in hydro. It was in the early 21st century when several researchers suggested that the Banky Mitchell turbine could be used to absorb wind energy as a cross-flow wind turbine. Now cross-flow wind turbines look like this. There are an arrangement of blades around the circle in a module and these modules can be stacked as long as you want. And usually the blade number is somewhere between 6 and 24, although research has suggested 16 as being the ideal number, although there is argument and people have suggested things like 6, 7, 8, uh, 20, 22, all kinds of things. But 16 is supposed to be pretty good. And when they stack them like that, of course, they put them in a case, and normally there's a wind deflector around them to keep the wind in the right place and deflect it where you want it to do its work. So the main advantage of it is it'll start at really low wind speeds, cutting in as low as 2 metres per second, and so it's an excellent candidate as a self-starting turbine. It has low noise, remarkable um, stability, and its general approach makes it ideal for use in urban areas. It's a simple structure, and so there's low maintenance costs, and it's not as dangerous for flying birds as HAWTs. However, the power coefficient is quite low. It's 0.12, though that can be improved by adding augmentation devices. It also has a problem with high wind speeds, and it's not recommended to go more than 20 metres per second, and so you'd need some kind of braking system. So mechanical brakes or electromagnetic brakes or a combination of the both of them so that you would sense the wind speed and brake the turbine because they are made of lightweight materials which is part of what keeps the cost down but they can't really stand those high wind speeds anyway. Augmentation devices are going to be things like guide nozzles or guide vanes, the casing itself, windshields deflectors and cowlings, and you see those in things like the power pod, for example. In terms of the ridge blade, you can see that the rooftop that you recommended to sit it on is acting as a very big deflector. Now, 
everything has an impact on a wind turbine, but the key design parameters are actually only really four of them. The first one is obviously the blade profile. Now originally they were just half a circle, so they were just that shape, 180 degree part of a circle. Though of course these days what's coming in are airfoils. So the shape of the blade, the number of the blade we've already talked about, and um, where the blade is angled to an imaginary line drawn through this centre, and it's recommended that the angle be about 45 degrees or so. And the final one's a little bit surprising. It's the ratio of the thickness of the blade to the size of this diameter of your rotor, and it's recommended to be somewhere between 0.53 and 0.78 as a ratio to give the right thickness of those blades for it to act as a wind turbine. So I appreciate that's a lot of information to give on the history, design, use and some of the parameters of a cross-flow wind turbine. And that's because two reasons. One, the ridge blade is a cross-flow wind turbine. And two, when I did the research for this video, there was a surprising lack of available information. Plenty of really nice advertising explaining how it all works, but not much in the way of how it performs and why it performs. Now, Ridge Blade are a small company, they don't sell directly to the consumer, and so they, I believe, get overwhelmed quite a lot, so fair enough. But it is an exciting looking thing. Now, cross flow wind turbines are not the most efficient, as we mentioned in the video. But I don't believe that getting on the one horse of efficiency is the answer. There are always other considerations to take into account. So you're thinking about things like the look of it, the environment that it's in, the urban environment, the cost of actually putting it up there, all that sort of stuff will come into play when deciding on a wind turbine. Now a great part of the wind turbine cost is the structure you stick it on. And a great advantage of the ridge blade is the structure's already there, it's, it's your house. And so that's going to reduce the cost dramatically because you don't have to build a tower. So when people say, oh, it's such and such and you should only do that, then they're not really considering the whole range of what needs to be done. I mean, the ridge blade is, and like all cross-flow turbines, very quiet. And that's important in an urban environment where you don't want the whiz-whiz-whiz of a standard turbine. Another thing very much in favour of cross-flow wind turbines is they work very well in that height range of half a metre to ten metres off the ground and very well in that wind speed range of two metres to twenty metres per second wind speed and of course that makes them a very good fit for an urban environment and a domestic use. I certainly would consider getting one if the price was right. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.